Hi everyone, we just ended an amazing session in, in China and we are starting our Japanese session here to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day with our colleague from Future Food Japan, Chris Kraus. Chris, the stage is yours. Enjoy the next two hours with our amazing guests. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. Cool. Um, yeah, so we'll be hearing from, we'll be having uh, four different panelists present first uh, and then do a short Q&A session after each one of those. And then for the second half of the Japan session, uh, we're going to have a panel discussion moderated by uh, Momoko Nakamura. Uh, and there will be five people involved in that kind of going around on, a, on a, what should make for a really interesting discussion. Um, so first up, uh, we have Yuko uh, Yasunaga, who is head of the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, and he'll be uh, talking with us a little bit about their STEP program and a few other exciting initiatives. So Yuko, whenever you are ready, uh, to take it over. Hi, thank you very much, Andy. Hello, everybody. And thank, thank you. you very much, Andy, please, Ari, for, for this very excellent opportunity. Uh, I'm Yuko Yasunaga, uh, as uh, Chris introduced, uh, kindly introduced, and the, I'm head of uh, the Unido Tokyo office. Uh, yes, uh, the, it is my great honor and pleasure uh, to join this uh, the online event. Uh, the, the, and the, the, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude uh, to all the people who uh, devotedly work to organize this event. Thank you very much. Uh, the, uh, yes, uh, the, my presentation is uh, uh, titled uh, the Agribusiness and Unido ITPO Tokyo's uh, te Technology Database Step. And my focus of my presentation is uh, the uh, opportunity for innovative, uh, innovators in agribusiness. Yes, uh, the first, I would like to uh, uh, the, introduce, briefly introduce my organization to you. Uh, the mission of my office, Unido Tokyo office, is to empower and to encourage Japanese private industries to promote investment and uh, the technology transfer from Japan to developing and emerging countries. Uh, and the, our office is uh, located in the central part of Tokyo, and we have almost uh, 20 uh, staffs in this office. And in the, uh, in the field of technology transfer, we are operating our technology database called the STEP, uh, STEP, uh, S-T, small e, P, and P. Uh, STEP stands for or Sustainable Technology Promotion Platform. Uh, uh, this is, oh, I'm very sorry, this is a little bit dark, but the, uh, this is uh, the, our brochure. And the, you can find uh, the uh, contents of step, step uh, the, by visiting our homepage. I will announce uh, the URL later. And the almost uh, 100 uh, technologies are registered in STEP after our evaluation, uh, both from technological and managerial point of view. And STEP features four categories of sustainable technology technologies, which are indispensable for upgrading quality of life of the people living in developing and emerging countries. First, energy. Second, environment, third, agribusiness, and fourth, human health. Uh, from the context of today's event, I would like to speak especially about agribusiness uh, technologies. At the end, among 100 technologies, the majority of technology providers are SMEs, small and medium enterprises which do not have strong commercial channels to overseas markets, even though uh, they have reliable and superior technologies. Um, maybe a most, uh, I expect that the most of you may remember that the Japanese 
uh, representative uh, manufacturers uh, like uh, Toyota, Panasonic, or Hitachi, uh, the, those uh, manufacturers also depend on SMEs for uh, the parts and the components. Uh, if you would like to know more about STEP, please visit our homepage. Its URL is www.unido.org.jp www.unido.org.jp Yes, Ari, almost, if you look at the step at the homepage, uh, you can find almost 30 technologies uh, which are registered at the in step. Those are proposed from Japanese companies in agribusiness category. The technologies are categorized in four types food processing technologies, the agriculture production enhancement technologies, the adaptation technology to climate changes, and water resource supply related technologies. For example, uh, those include uh, the hydrogel based film material for cultivation in low participation uh, area, uh, precipitation area, sorry. Uh, new agricultural materials to improve soil conditions, new refrigerating system uh, using strong electric field for uh, longer preservation of uh, the fruits or meat or fishes, uh, sherbet type ice making equipment for preserving fishes on the ship, uh, food dehydration, food dryer equipment for drying vegetables and fruits for more preservation and so on. So that the, uh, the, we can uh, the, the send this information via homepage to a potential user in uh, developing and emerging countries. So this is uh, the outline of our uh, technology database step in agribusiness area. And the, if we look at, or if you look at uh, these technologies in detail, uh, we may be aware of, or you may be aware of the uh, following three characteristics. First, some of these technologies are high tech, uh, but considerable numbers of those technologies are not, not high tech, rather than low tech or combination of existing technologies. Second characteristic, the most of these technologies are developed by SMEs and startups in Japan, which means that those can plausibly be applied to developing and emerging countries with lower cost compared with current solutions. Third characteristic, the most of these technology need customization uh, to the specific environment of developing and emerging countries, uh, and also need some demonstration to the users and the government of those countries to show their effectiveness. Uh, in my understanding, agribusiness technologies are typical conversion or convergence type of technologies. It composed of convergence of uh, the different areas of technologies. It is not only from agricultural department of universities, nor from uh, the farmers, but from everywhere in academism and business. That includes, of course, physics, chemistry, molecular biology, material science, ICT, medical science, environmental science, civil engineering, and so on. Uh, this century, uh, 21st century, uh, the, the human beings uh, must face a very serious shortage of food, both in the context of quantity and quality. I am firmly convinced that many advanced research efforts and technologies can be combined to newly create the brand new agribusiness technology or uh, a new, 
they can be combined to newly create the new usage of the technologies, which were not originally thought. I would like to say that now's the time to activate the network of researchers, entrepreneurs, investors, and government officials to collaborate across their boundaries for the creation of new agribusiness. Sometimes or it is said quite often that Japanese researchers and uh, businessmen tend to uh, live in uh, octopus pods. Octopus pods is uh, the, uh, called in Japanese takotsubo, uh, which represents uh, the original fields of work because it is quite comfortable for, for uh, researchers and businessmen. However, we know that the small number of awakened people are actively linking people across the fields. And we need to collaborate with those awakened people or, or to create new agribusiness. In the sense, I believe that the, this event is a very good ice-breaking opportunity for all the stakeholders. Thank you very much from Yuko Yasunaga. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, we appreciate it. Appreciate the time. Uh, okay, great. Um, okay, and so I, I think uh, we can go ahead and and uh, head over to Mr. Charles. Uh, yeah, sorry. And and do you have a do you have a good website to share as well? Actually, for for step. And we can uh, we can put that on YouTube. Yeah. Yes. Please visit later. Okay, okay, thank you. okay. Yeah, I think we can put that on YouTube as well so everyone can okay, learn you. about that. Thank you very much. Um, so now uh, we'll head over to Mr. Charles Bolico of the UN Food and Agriculture Organization uh, who will share with us a brief presentation about some of their initiatives happening. All right, and so I don't know if you can see me, but it's okay even if you don't. Uh, thank you very much, Chris, and uh, friends and colleagues, uh, greetings, wherever you're listening from. I work for FAO, but I'm not speaking today as a specialist in food systems, which I'm not. I thought I would speak as one normal citizen of this planet who knows from personal experience uh, how crucially important uh, Mother Nature, uh, that's our planet, is in providing uh, the food that each one of us needs to eat on a daily basis. I will not dwell on how important food is for all of us. Let me just say that we are all familiar, I assume, with the uh, 17 Sustainable Development Goals, uh, SDGs, and in the United Nations, we all agree, uh, along with all our partners, that all 17 SDGs are equally important. They are interdependent and complementary. At the same time, in every language that I have familiarized myself with, a good nine of them, including Japanese, you will always find an expression conveying the idea that a hungry belly has no ears. In other words, this is a kind of shared culture and wisdom, which put in today's context actually recognizes and confirms that food is central to the SDG agenda. It's so hard to imagine an SDG that can be achieved with hungry uh, people or people who don't have good nutrition. But where does food actually come from? That's a question that most of us, it looks obvious we don't always ask ourselves that question. There is no more manna falling from heaven. Food comes from mother nature. But how so? How does that happen? Let me first tell you a personal story. 
I was born in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and not in Kinshasa. I was born in the countryside. You may have heard about the Congo Basin, equatorial forest. That's where I was born in a small city with only 23,000 people. And uh, the wonderful thing that I always remember, you may not believe this, but hunger did not exist when I was growing up in that place where I was born and raised. People did grow food in many ways, but when, even when you had absolutely nothing to eat, what did you do? You walked 100, 200 yards into the bush, rainforest. You always came back with something. Could be a white fruit or vegetable, could be root, tuber. It could be a protein rich insect and God knows how much, how many of those I have eaten in my whole life. There was always food. There were situations where you would go during this dry season to some rivers and you did not even need to fish. You picked up fish, you chose based on the size. Sometimes if this is this one is ugly, I don't want it. You picked up fish and took home. What do I mean to say here? I mean to say, if we let our planet help us, if we leave it, we maintain it in a healthy condition, it can feed us. Have we done so? I doubt it. That's why today, when I call my mother, these things no longer happen. It was so true, no hunger, that in my mother tongue, the word hunger is represented by two words, different words. One of them is njala, which just means I have zero food, but it did not apply to anybody. There was always something to food. So that forms another word, which is jilo, and it means I haven't eaten fish or meat for some time. So that tells you that food, Mother Nature can provide it, but we must live it healthy, which we have failed to do. Now back to my question, where does food come from? In our modern world, we know that it comes essentially from agriculture. But when we say agriculture, it's not only about crops. We're talking about animal husbandry, animal health, aquaculture, fisheries. We're talking about forestry. All of this comes into you know, the uh, definition of agriculture. So we have diversified sources of food. All of them have only one thing in common. They all heavily depend on the resources provided by the planet. Land, water, forest, we name those. So the food is grown using a whole lot of natural resources but that continues during transportation, during distribution, and even during and after consumption, we are still utilizing natural resources. So as you see, we need to always look at food as a system. The value of this system must be increased for the prosperity of both people and planet. And there you hear the three major Ps of the SDG agenda. People, planet, prosperity. Let me share some data in this regard. And perhaps I would rather share my screen quickly if that works right now, Chris, if you allow me. I will share my screen at this point, just so all of us are looking at the same thing. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, just to share some data. As you can see, agriculture is the largest consumer of the world's freshwater resources. And more than 20% of the energy used globally is expended on food production and supply. That's a lot. Food systems contribute up to 29% of all greenhouse gas emissions 
and continue to overuse increasingly scarce natural resources. Now, the third element that we must pay attention is the two very significant demographic, demographic changes that are expected to take place by 2050. The first one is that what the, the world population will increase to reach nearly 10 billion people. And this requires an increase of food production by no less than 50%. Actually, some projections show 60%. In addition to that, 66% of the world's population will be living by 2050 in cities. And this will bring additional stress to our current food systems. How do we make sure all these people have access to a sufficient amount of food, which must also be of good quality? That means nutritious. Most of them will have no access to any land anyway. What can we do? Can we actually increase food production to feed everyone in 2050? The answer is clearly yes, we can do that. But the real challenge all of us face is how sustainable can we do so? How sustainably can we produce food without destroying the land, without exhausting uh, water resources, making sure that future generations, that's our grandchildren, their own offspring, will find a world in which they can live a healthy life. That is a real challenge. And let me tell you something flat out. There is no possibility that we would achieve sustainable agriculture by just upscaling, and I'm speaking here now, by just upscaling the current food production practices that will not allow us to live up to the uh, Paris Agreement. We will not be able to achieve SDGs by just upscaling what we're doing now. We must be creative innovative to come up with more sustainable solutions. And now we're fighting COVID-19. I think it provides us with a glaring testimony to the weaknesses that we did not always see clearly in our food systems, both in terms of the food safety aspects that generated the problem. We started in Wuhan, as we all know now, and also in terms of the significant weaknesses and lack of resilience in the food systems that we have uh, led to disruptions, that have led to disruptions in food supply chains. And so with that information, let me conclude by making only one or two points. Transforming, the first one is transforming food systems aims to save the planet. If we do that, we will be able to achieve virtually all SDGs. And I have prepared here a summary of what I think we don't have enough time to go through all of them. That's why I wanted to share this screen. Just let me give one example. The first bullet says, we will be able to give people better access to more nutritious food, which is affordable. That's SDG two. We will create more decent jobs including for women and the youth. We will lift so many people uh, from poverty and we will reduce inequalities. If you look at that and on, we are achieving SDGs 1, 5, 8, and 10, and so on, it goes on. Let me take this bullet, which refers to SDG 12. It's one, two, three, four, five, fifth, sixth bullet. We will produce food and consume more responsibly and reduce for loss and waste at all levels. And we achieve SDG 12, thereby we will contribute to climate action, which is SDG 13. The point I want to make is that innovations, good innovations, transformation of our food systems will actually guarantee more prosperity for all that will guarantee that we can achieve SDGs. And so, in closing, let me say that I hope by now, looking at all this data, uh, all of us understand why the Secretary General has called a food system summit, a UN food system summit, which will take place uh, next year, 
to discuss this topic at the highest level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charles. That was, that was really excellent content and from, from a really good perspective. Um, I think uh, one thing that, that sticks with me that, that I learned from you uh, at, at last year's summer school in Tokyo is one takeaway thing is, is when you mentioned when you go into the store, you know, to, to make sure you pick up the ugly produce, pick up the ugly fruit that no one else is going to take. And ever, ever since when I, when I go to the store, I, I think about that when, uh, when shopping and that was, you're full of many good examples that people can implement into their lives to, to be more sustainable and in, in how they're consuming. So. And indeed, not only ugly food, but food that is about to expire. Yes. We yes. responsible consumers buy that first. Yeah. To save it for, from, you know, being thrown away. That's yes. uh, what you want Yes. Uh, thank you for, exactly. for reminding me of that. So you see, all of us has a, has a, every one of us has a role to play in saving the planet. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Thank My you. Pleasure. Okay. Were there any additional questions for Charles or not? I'm, I'm jumping in uh, one second because uh, I take advantage uh, of this moment to remind that this year for the first time on September 29th, FAO is going to celebrate uh, the day of awareness of food loss and waste. So us as Future Food Institute, we are going to support a lot FAO everywhere in the world really to spread the message because uh, the issue of avoiding food loss and waste is for sure something uh, that uh, touches everyone and is something uh, that can involve everyone to take action in our daily life. And just to give you some numbers, during this pandemic, uh, during this lockdown, we have been uh, doing several surveys in different parts of the world. And the very positive sign is that people staying in homes is spontaneously learning on how to waste less. And here in Italy, for example, uh, uh, people was, uh, of course, wasting a lot in the normal life. Now, almost the 90% of people are declaring that they're wasting almost nothing. So it's a huge uh, positive sign. We are reconnecting with our life, our body, our food, being more careful about, uh, more careful, more conscious about um, how we, we basically live and interact with the world out there. So it's, it's a good sign and something to share on her day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charles. And James, thank you so much, Yuko-san. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Okay. So now I believe um, we'll be transitioning over. Uh, I'm actually going to present quickly uh, a brief presentation on some of the future food activities uh, with the Future Food Hub in Japan. So I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, Okay. Oh, okay. So, uh, as I mentioned, I'll be just be sharing a little bit more about uh, the launching of the Future Food Hub in Japan. Um, so, as you can see. Sorry, just let me get the screen out of the way real quick. Um, okay, thanks. As you can see, uh, the Future Food is a global ecosystem uh, made up of many different hubs, offices, and ambassadors kind of spread all around the world. Uh, and we're building our hub and living lab here in Tokyo in collaboration with our project partners, Tokyo Tatemono. Um, so now to speak a little bit to, to Tokyo Tatemono, um, or sorry, let me go back. 
So why the move to Japan? That, that's the next slide. Um, so Future Food has had strong connections in Japan uh, for a number of years, and we're excited to, now, to announce this next kind of larger project in Japan. Um, Japan obviously has a rich agricultural and culinary history. Uh, you'll hear more about this from some of the presenters, uh, both who have already spoken, but, but also especially a little bit later on. Um, and uh, we'll also be talking about some issues related to sustainability, which are specific to Japan and how hopefully we as Future Food can, can be a part of the solution in that. Um, Tokyo being an essential international hub, uh, which will continue hosting global events, uh, both in and outside of the food world. Uh, and then lastly, for the why, why move to Japan, uh, the ideal partnerships piece there with Tokyo Tatemono. Uh, so for a little bit more background on Tokyo Tatemono, um, so the company was founded in 1896 as Japan's first real estate company. Uh, they have a great deal of experience and a long-term vision for sustainable and innovative cities. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm just presenting as a, as a project partner here on behalf of, of the Tokyo Tatemono, but working with uh, Future Food. So in terms of, uh, so, sorry, oh, sorry. Uh, so not only does Tokyo Tatemono look at real estate opportunities to grow their business, but uh, as community building as a large part of their mission as well. So as part of this approach to solving social issues, uh, they're working with a variety of businesses in the, in the senior care and child care sector as well. Uh, on top of that, Tetemono is uh, taking very significant steps in becoming a sustainable developer and creating more environmentally friendly buildings. And lastly, uh, our mission, the mission of Future Food aligns quite well with that of Tokyo Tetemono. And together we aim to build sustainable food communities uh, as, a, as a major contributor to, to smart cities. So in the next section, um, we'll, we'll go through some of the facilities that, that we're using in the Kyobashi area of Tokyo. So the base of our activities here in Japan will be in, in the Kyobashi area, which is bordered by Nihonbashi and Yaesu. And for those unfamiliar with this neighborhood, uh, it's just, just east of Tokyo Station and just north of Ginza. Uh, this area was an important part of, of Tokyo's rich food history. Nihonbashi was the, the site of the first major Tokyo fish market uh, called Uogashi, which led to the creation of the world famous Tsukiji fish market. And Kyobashi was, was the site of a well-known fruit and vegetable market during the early Edo period, uh, known as the Kyobashi Daikon, Daikongashi. Um, so as you can see, Kyobashi also has a number of restaurants and food businesses, which have been around for quite some time. Uh, we aim to find the right ways to honor and highlight the work of these establishments while also working towards sustainable food futures. Okay, now onto the Kyobashi Living Lab. So in line with this concept of, of respecting tradition while embracing innovation, Future Food and Tokyo Tatemono are coming together to build new food communities. So the headquarters of our operations and activities in Tokyo uh, will be right inside this special building, which is the Tokyo Food Lab. Um, and to speak a little more to this slide, so these six principles uh, are at the core of what we're doing with the Kyobashi Living Lab. Through a variety of events, workshops, and, and programs, we want to bring uh, all kinds of different people and change makers together. So this will include farmers, students, chefs, educators, uh, professionals, both in and outside of the food world, and people working in the public and private sector. Um, so basically, as, as Charles mentioned, uh, the food, food systems really touch everyone and touch everything. We're all impacted by this. Um, so we want everyone to know that, that there's a seat at the table in the sustainable food movement, and we want everyone to be involved and, and a part of, of the Kyobashi Living Lab. So 
here's just a quick look at some of the main topics and themes for the activities that we'll be focusing on. Um, just to name a few, our, our events will we'll take a deeper dive into the topics of food as medicine, food waste, uh, food packaging issues and solutions, food access, regenerative farming and responsible land use, fermentation, uh, agro innovation in smart cities and urban farming, which we'll hopefully talk a little bit more about uh, in the later session as well today. Uh, rural revitalization and farming in Japan and beyond, which we'll also touch on today in the later session. Um, so clearly, you know, we've had to put a hold on our offline and person activities for now due to the pandemic. But as Future Food Hub in Japan, we'll continue to do all that we can to find impactful ways to be of service during this time. Uh, in which so many people are facing extreme hardship, both related to food and outside of that. So we'll get a little bit better look at the uh, at the tatemono venues which make up the Kyobashi Living Lab. So this is the top the top floor of the second floor of Tokyo Food Lab is known as the U uh, Kitchen and Dining Space. This venue hosts a variety of chefs from Japan and abroad. Here we'll be able to get an in-depth look at you know, preparation and cooking techniques and learn more not only about the technical side of cooking, but also the cultural side, uh, the importance of food as entertainment, as well as the immense impact that, that ingredients, recipes, cooking styles, and food have in terms of cultural sustainability and significance. The first floor, the bottom floor of Tokyo Food Lab uh, is the headquarters and primary prototype machine for the company Plant X. So Plant X builds uh, highly tech, like high technologically advanced hardware and software systems to grow very nutrient dense food in urban environments under controlled settings. Um, again, as, as Charles alluded to, urbanization is on the rise, not only in Tokyo, but around the world. And as that continues to rapidly increase, uh, finding solutions for growing food closer to where we consume it uh, has never been more important. So we're excited to highlight the work of Plantex and see how we can best work together in Kyobashi and beyond. Uh, the next space that we'll be utilizing for the Kyobashi Living Lab is the Suiba Kitchen Studio space. It's just a short walk away from Tokyo Food Lab. It's a nice open space with a full kitchen downstairs and seating upstairs. So a number of interesting food focus events have taken place here and we're excited to bring more unique events to this space when the time is right to do so. Next, we'll be utilizing the Tokyo Square Garden Plaza space. Uh, so we plan on launching a produce and food market, a green market of sorts in collaboration with Pocket Marche who's built an amazing platform and network which connects uh, small farmers all across Japan directly with consumers. And we'll be hearing from Mikio of Pocket Marche in, in the later session as well. Lastly, there's a uh, city lab space, which is on the sixth floor of Tokyo Square Garden. Uh, and that's where we'll host conference events and, and a variety of different learning opportunities. Uh, this space is unique in that it's designed specifically for hosting events which are focused uh, on the SDGs. So thank you for your time and we're hoping that when the time is right to see all of you in, in Kyobashi at some point. And until then, we're looking forward to more online activities together. Thank you yeah. so much, Chris. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to add some, some words because uh, together with FAO and all our partners, uh, we're going to be back uh, to Japan uh, soon. We hope, we cross our finger. And at the end of August, uh, we're going to host uh, the Climate Shapers Bootcamp uh, together with FAO. And uh, of course, also together with the support of uh, our great partners from the world of, of UNIDO. And so I'm very happy that uh, also today we are here together with our two major partners. So last year has been uh, the 
the kickoff of this journey. Together with Unido, we were launching this Unido Award for Agri-Food. And uh, we are also very glad because uh, one of the winning uh, startup, one of the winning ideas actually was uh, a project from Japan, exactly. And, and then also we started the, this journey together with FAO with the Climate Shapers Bootcamp and the FAO eLearning Academy. So this summer, uh, of course, uh, we, we have been forced to cancel the first part of the program, but we're going to reopen and restart the entire season exactly from Japan. So we're very glad uh, that actually this is going to happen and part of uh, our trainings are going to move online. But uh, of course, the partnership with the FAO Learning Center uh, is an amazing opportunity also to highlight the incredible work that all UN agencies are already doing, really not only spreading the word, but also developing tangible projects uh, everywhere in the world really to I say to not only to tackle the SDGs, but to jump into the new world following a framework that is very clear for everyone. Everybody can understand that and everyone can take a step really to build a more sustainable food system and a more sustainable world. So thank you so much um, overall to our two friends and guests because uh, the, the journey that we are doing together with FAO and Unido for us uh, uh, is a, a priceless experience and very impactful uh, uh, way, I'd say, to, 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 to deliver our, our work. Thank you so much. Very well said. Thank, thank you, Sarah. Appreciate it. Um, uh, next up, we're going to have a, a presentation as well from, I believe, is Hiro on the line? Yeah, Hiro Taka Tanaka, and maybe also Akiko. Yes. Okada. I'm online. <clears throat> Okay. Okay. So whenever, whenever you're ready. Okay. Can I just start? Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, thank you for Chris uh, for introducing us. Okay. Just wait. Wait. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see. Okay, that. good. So, hello everyone. So, my name is uh, Hiro Tanaka uh, from Sigmaxis Japan. So, uh, during this session, I'd like to talk about so what is happening in food tech innovation in a broader way, how large cooperation and the startups are collaborating together, and then what uh, we have done over the last three years around smart kitchens in Japan. So, um, I'm working for uh, Sigmaxis. Uh, who is the organizer of Smart Kitchen Summit Japan uh, since 2017. So uh, I worked for a plants company and a, a global management consulting firm. And now uh, we are trying to create a, a food innovators ecosystem uh, from uh, Japan to connect with uh, global people. So during this session, uh, let me talk about what is ICS Japan about and then brief introduction of what is happening and then uh, also what is happening in Japan. So this is a um, entire picture of what we are doing uh, to create a food innovation ecosystem uh, in Japan. So uh, we, we're, our business is mainly a consulting, but at the same time, we aspire to create an ecosystem where large corporation or ventures or experts, and also Japanese uh, ent entrepreneur or overseas uh, players, so everyone connect together. So uh, we uh, do a uh, conference called Smart Kitchen Summit Japan once a year. And then also at the same time, we organize a, a community um, almost every month. And then also we uh, share the insight uh, to the global community. And then our community uh, ranges not only from Japan, but also to global. Certainly Future Food Institute is our partner, cross partner. And then, so our aspiration is, okay, let's move together. <clears throat> so there is a one vision. Uh, our vision is uh, not only just to expand food tech, it's more like, a, so we want to create a new experience and the new classics uh, through science and technology. And also we want to make society and the people sustainable and happier. So in the sustainable way. Now, at, and also at the same time, so we believe 
food is a culture. So therefore, we are thinking about how we can inherit our traditions tradition to the future by leveraging the uh, cutting edge technology. Tech should not come in front of the culture, but tech can help culture to sustain in a good way. <clears throat> Let me talk about so how SKS Japan look like. So we have started the one uh, three years ago. So in the beginning, that was a small event. So we had about 150 people, 20 speakers, and then gradually, so it's expanded. So last year we had a 500 participants from 200 companies. And then also we had a 60 uh, speakers all over the world, all over the industry. As you can see in this picture, so we had a, a speakers from uh, United Nations and Google and also Sarah. And then also we work and also we had a, a speaker from leading uh, retailers in Japan and also space agency and also uh, leading media wide Japan uh, chief editor and so on. So this is a picture, maybe some of you guys are in this picture, Sarah as well and Toto as well. So um, the key message here is entrepreneur or entrepreneur within Japan, outside Japan, start connecting through this community. This is really great. So this is a, a picture of the uh, participants of SKS Japan. So it's really unique that we have a wide variety of participants from all over the industry, from food manufacturer, plants company, retailers, and also restaurants and ventures, and then investors and so on. So this is a theme we uh, covered in the SKS Japan last year. So I don't want to go to detail, but um, so sustainability is one of the uh, one of the key issue, and then and also we covered uh, entire topic in this one. And then let me talk about our uh, community initiative. So uh, we organize a bi monthly or monthly event. So in real, and also we organize an online community in on Facebook. So uh, so that by doing that. So we try to keep people connected without losing their passion. So SK Japan is important, but it, this is just a once a year event. So we want to keep people connected to make something happen. And also um, last year, so we proposed a future food vision. So this is a more like a, our will. What kind of future we want to invent? So future is not something to focus. It's more like a to invent. So therefore, based on the conversation with key players and also based on the analysis of the demographics and the tech prevention, uh, tech expansion and so on. So we identified 12 uh, future food vision. So red, red, uh, red color is uh, about is something to do with sustainability. But uh, so we, be, we strongly believe that the future in, we can create uh, together with you guys. So probably many of you guys are familiar with why this kind of food in move innovation is happening these days. So we basically see that two major forces. So one is a social issue on the food. And then also, so the second pillar is a diversified value of food. So as for social issue on the food, so I don't want to go in detail, but there are so many issues which is triggered by food. It's such as food loss, like protein crisis, malnutrition, food, that kind of stuff. So we definitely need to overcome these issues. But at the same time, we really see this long tail needs of food important. On the left hand side, left -hand side is the current need of food, which is quick cooking, less expensive eating, tasty, healthy, or high quality, safe. So most of the values are sort of like the satisfies over the last 50 years by developing a strong value chain in the, or a strong food system. But when we take a look at the trend and the people, so we see the wide variety of value or needs of food, such as, <laughs> okay, people want to cook more with fun or people want to spend more time on cooking, or people want to discover more on food, or people want to connect with through food and so on. So in order to capture this long-term needs, eventually tech and science matters. 
by having a lowering cost of tech and science so we can identify the subtle needs of people so through tech and science so eventually this redefining the a value of food is happening so this is a, a keynote speech of sks north america three years ago so they already mentioned that uh, let's see the value beyond convenience efficiency and taste so unique point is um sarah continues to mention in her presentation so uh during COVID 19 so many people ask us whether this trend continues or stops or accelerated. We strongly believe that COVID-19 impacted on resetting the current food value chain, which means we probably may be able to solve the social issue related to food. And also, so during this situation, people see more value, more wider value on food. So which means the definition of food happening. So therefore, when we discuss with um, Japanese fr friend uh, within Japan, so we believe that uh, let's keep doing, let's accelerate food innovation together. So especially during this period of time. So this is a, a key message. Then lastly, let me talk about briefly about what is happening in Japan. So one key movement is big players are moving in and showing strong interest in food tech. As you can see in this picture, so large manufacturers, and there are also large retailers or restaurants, or major risk players or food companies are stepping into this space to explore new offering around food, which is a very good sign. And then second, message is increasing presence of food tech ventures. So this is just a part of uh, food tech related, food related ventures in Japan. So as you can see, so you see the future food and nutrition ventures, new drink ventures, new snack, and also food loss, new package ventures, restaurant tech, and then green rectangle illustrates the uh, ventures, something to do with sustainability. So sustainability is becoming the one of the biggest topic in Japan. So therefore, so we are actually committed to uh, ignite the uh, presence uh, of these ventures. So as a part of our community event, so we launched a uh, event called Food Tech Venture Day. This intends to identify or find, so Japan, Japanese ventures uh, related to food. So we have conducted twice. And then second one is about food loss and, uh, loss and waste. So there were 10 very unique uh, startups, uh, which is around how they can reduce food loss or how they can uh, leverage residuals uh, coming from the production process, how they can make some like uh, energies and also some like wines or alcohols so there was um, quite a lot of unique ventures from this event. So in this food tech venture event, so we created a food innovation map, which illustrates the width of the food innovation. So what kind of user experience we see, uh, like uh, uh, what do you eat at home? What do you eat outside and the cooking and also purchasing experience. And also we see some technologies to cover this trend. So this actually helped us to identify where innovation happens or where the white space, where we want to have more services. So this is a sort of like a common language for us to identify where we want to create new food services. Then lastly, so um, we see the accelerating collaboration beyond the industries. So there are several uh, unique initiatives which is triggered by some uh, interspheres. One is a Space Food X, so which is uh, driven by JAXA and the Real Tech Fund and also by us. So this is actually to identify uh, food experience and the production uh, in a super close environment such as space. And then they identify business opportunities uh, on the earth. And the OPPO, also Open Meals is a, a 3D printed, 3D food printed uh, sushi service restaurants. 
So we're about 20 or more uh, players are gathering. And then also, as Chris mentioned, Tokyo Food Lab is actually uh, gathering uh, food innovators. So as you can see, so there are many movements uh, around food tech, food innovation, and also we see the more and more sustainable uh, services. So we are committed to uh, bring this food innovation uh, accelerated. So in order to make it happen, so we are thinking to uh, do the Smart Kitchen Summit Japan this year. So we are not super sure, so what is the format? Maybe it's a combination of online and offline, but we are uh, planning to do the SKS Japan this year in the autumn, November. So we are looking forward to connecting with you. And if you are interested, uh, please let us know. So we are happy to collaborate with you guys. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Hiro. That was yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> you guys seem to know everyone working in uh, in food tech in, in Japan. It's it's always exciting to chat with you and to hear from yeah. you. Yeah, we do. Yeah. We are very happy <laughs> collaborating with you guys. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Um, okay. So I think next up, uh, we're going to go to our panel discussion, uh, which is going to be uh, hosted by Momoko Nakamura. And she might want to give a, a brief description of, of what she does, which is probably going to be, oh, sorry, I'll start my, oh, no, no videos on, um, which will be better than mine. But my first introduction to her was actually picking up her book before I ever knew about her um, and flipping through it. It's an awesome book called Plant-Based Tokyo that's in uh, both Japanese and English with some really amazing photos uh, and speaks to a lot of the different restaurants and food makers in Tokyo uh, who are part of the plant-based movement. Uh, so I read through that book and then actually got connected to Momoko uh, recently. And she's an amazing food communicator in many different ways. So I thought it would be best to maybe pass the torch to her and let her kind of lead an interesting conversation with about uh, five different change makers and uh, people who are involved in sustainable food movements of their own. So I'll, I'll pass it over to you guys. Great. Thanks, Chris. Actually, before you go, can I ask you something really quickly? Uh, yeah, of course. The, yes. Can you hear me better this way or? Okay. Better. Mm, I think the first route was better, actually. Yeah, no, not plugged in. Okay. Hmm. All good? Yep, all good. Thank you. Okay. Um, I mean, clearly there have been some brilliant presentations from across Japan and then um, initially from China being uh, the, baton, the baton being passed from Shanghai to, to Tokyo and um, then it'll go all around, around the world across Europe and the US and end up in Hawaii. And so to be part of this first batch of conversations is um, such a pleasure. And um, I think the discussion that we'll be having now will differ quite a bit from um, the presentations that uh, that uh, came before, it'll be quite casual. And if I'm at the same time, I'm looking at the um, the chat space within YouTube. And so if there are specific questions, I'll try to keep my eye on, on that as well. So please feel free to chime in with questions or comments um, as we go along. So I think, do we have other people <laughs> in Tokyo? Well, not just in Tokyo, but across Japan joining us, everyone can, um, turn on their mics and turn on their videos. Yay! Hello. 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 あの、今日は英語でディスカッションさせていただくんですけど、もしあの、わからないこととか、私が言ってることがわからない場合とか、もしくはあの、なんか
ちょっと言いたいことがあるんだけどなかなか英語では伝わらないかもしれないっていうことがあったら全然手を挙げてくださいでえー、っとなんだろう、まあ、とにかく今はまあえー、っと今現在、えー、ご覧になっている方はいらっしゃるんですけどこれからは、えー、と何百人とか何千人に流がるあの動画が残るかと思うのでより多くの方にこの情報が伝わったらいいなと思っています。OK, we're going to get on with it.、Um, first,、uh, I kind of sorted, sorted out what sort of Overall thesis、um, would make the most sense for our discussion today because we have less than an hour and there's just so much that we could be talking about. This incredibly brilliant and vibrant group of five people,、um, I'm sure we could be、um, chatting for hours over drinks. So I kind of honed in a little bit on our discussion. Uh, honed in our discussion a little bit to、um, the specific topic about the Japanese food system and what is uniquely Japanese. What are those、um, bits and pieces that are uniquely Japanese? The way that Japanese people think our historical past, our grandmother's kitchens, the traditional Japanese micro seasonal calendar,、um, specific.、Um, Uh, farm products that you might not find、um, in other places in the world, et cetera, et cetera. And so、um, I, I think if we can kind of continue to go back to what each of these, how each of these points、um, reflect these、uh, uniquely Japanese methods, that will be great.、Um, I would like to first go around the group.、Um, To understand a little bit more about what everyone does.、Um, everyone is an entrepreneur in their own right.、Um, everyone is at quite different stages of their businesses,、um, but using their platforms to think about our food systems, help us, help us edit the way we think, and、um, pivot the current structure.、Uh, And so, if you can kind of give like a 30 second spiel about who you are and what you do, I think that will be really helpful, especially because I'm you know, meeting everyone for the very first time as we speak.、Uh, so, John, would you like to go first? John, I think you're on mute. <laughs> oh. How's that? Can you hear that? Yes, brilliant. Thank you.、Uh, yeah, good, yeah. Yeah.、Um, my name's、uh, John Walsh.、Um, I'm a、uh, self employed urban farming consultant, and I've been、uh, basically working here in Tokyo for the last nine years. And I basically teach people how to uh, uh, sow、um, seeds like this and grow、uh, fresh fruit,、uh, just like our grandparents' generation did, which was basically、uh, just with water. And sunshine and nothing else. So, specifically, no chemicals.、Um, I specialize in vertical farming and I've taught nearly 900 people in the last nine years、um, how to basically grow food.、Um, I run、um, seminars, lectures, and、um, I basically run my own workshops and install gardens too.、Uh, my company,、uh, two years ago, we installed a organic garden at the Grand Hyatt、um, Tokyo in, in the point. Um, and I've installed about two or three school gardens too, including a rooftop garden at Montessori School in, in, in Tokyo two months ago, which is now working.、Um, and my goal is to basically teach as, as many people as possible the skills that our grandparents' our generation and every single generation before them knew, which was how to grow real fruit without chemicals. Yeah, that's it. Um, did you hear that again? Great. Yeah, great. Brilliant. Thank you. Mika san, do you want to go next? Okay.、Um, hi, I'm, my name is Mika Flan. I am a food creator and working in a zero waste restaurant. It's, a, it's called the Bio Labo House.、Um, so the, it's a, I started the Experimental、um, bio lab house、um, last、uh, December.、Um, 
So why I start the restaurant? Um, last year I uh, visited to uh, um, Helsinki. Um, it's a zero waste restaurant, Nora. And then so I, I, I met the owner, Luca. Um, it's um, good is inspire uh, for me, and so I started the zero waste restaurant in Tokyo. Um, uh, <laughs> that's it. That's all. That's all. Okay, great. No? So that's so because I'm working on a zero waste, zero yeah. food waste restaurant, and so that means food. Uh, reducing food loss, reducing or preventing food loss and food waste. Um, I believe I'm still such a newbie at the at the jargon, but I think that food loss and food waste are two slightly different things or categorized two slight in two slightly different ways. But um, because me Gaja is um, focused on uh, restaurant service, I think it falls into the food food waste category, and she also deals with composting and that sort of thing. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Minori san, hajimemashite. Yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Yeah, so um, my name is Minori. Um, I am a founder of Dana Village. It's an ecological holistic community in Fukushima Prefecture in Japan. And we also have a certified organic farm. And for us, I mean, for me, the main intention to start to start and continue Dana Village project is to give the opportunity for the people to live um, with awareness. And as my background is a nursing, I used to work as a nurse in a hospital. I want to, I want, I wanted to provide um, like holistic health um, related things to people to experience at, all, uh, at least. And then, um, so we have a community. So now you might see uh, one guy who was on backside of me. He was starting their stove. He's from South Africa and we have a um, few other volunteers around. So we live most of the year uh, with five, six other people as a volunteer. Yeah, so for me, like, um, it's all experimental based, but um, it's, I want to encourage people to live in a country as sustainable as possible and with a authentic uh, lifestyle. Yeah, maybe it can be introduction. Yes, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so Minori Science is in Fukushima Prefecture. Um, it, was um, quite hot in the news in 2011 because the big earthquake and um, nuclear disaster took place in around Fukushima. And I think that um, there are a lot of people who are now looking um, toward Fukushima for uh, hints on recovery when it comes to natural disasters, no matter where you are in the world. And so I really hope that we can speak a little bit further um, yeah. about getting a lot of that information from you. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Kyoko Nagano. Um, I'm not sure if I'm in the video, but um, hi. Um, I run three businesses. Um, one is called My Pal Inc. And well, uh, three of my businesses is all related to Japanese culture. And um, as you might see on my background, um, you can see this vegan sushi, which I helped organize it. Um, uh, it became number one on the Amazon book chart on the Amazon. Um, and my connection with the future food first started off with vegan sushi veggie dish workshop that I provided to the, the future food um, group who, um, they came when they came to Japan two years ago. And the second company that I uh, run is called Sake Lovers Wink, where I support the small craft breweries in Japan. Um, I don't know if you know, but uh, in 25 years, um, 
production and the numbers of the sake breweries decreased to half. And Jap uh, sake has always been a very important part in Japanese culture. And it's really sad to see the diminishing uh, of sake. Um, so we wanted to help support as much as possible to uh, for the small sake of craft breweries. And um, that's our mission. And the third company uh, I, uh, I run together with the uh, Hiroshi, who is the specialist on the fermentation. Uh, he's the uh, master graduate from the Tokyo University of Agriculture and the Bioscience. And um, we created this um, company called the Hakko Farm. Um, we all love fermented food. And I think um, it's very unique to our culture. Um, when you count the number of the fermented food here in Japan, there's about 450, which I think it's amazing number compared to the world. And um, I think also the key to the longevity of Japanese people is also connected to the fermented food. So, and also it can uh, lead to the, to save the food loss. And basically the fermentation started off to preserve food. So I feel there's so much possibility in the future uh, for the world to know about the Japanese fermentation culture. And um, Hakko Farm is um, trying to uh, introduce as many fermented food in Japan as much as possible. But currently we created this um, naturally sweet um, anko called uh, Hakko Anko, which is fermented anko, uh, fermented beans and fermented vegetables. So it's naturally sweet. And we're trying to uh, uh, make our product out soon. So that's our uh, company that I'm running right now. Um, and I'm uh, very, yeah, and I'm very much foodies and I really wanted to uh, help support the uh, community like sake community or food community as much as possible. So I'm looking forward to talk with all of you on the round table. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. I think we'll have a lot to discuss. Um, Mikio-san, Mikio-san. Hi, uh, hello, hello everyone. I'm Mik Mikio Yamaguchi. So our service is Pocket Marche. Pocket Marche. Okay. <laughs> I'm uh, pointing the right place, I hope. Uh, we are having a platform to connect the food producers and consumers directly, uh, which is uh, uh, our main service is a uh, marketplace, online marketplace, which is like this. Uh, with smartphone or PC, uh, customers can purchase the food produce uh, food things uh, from the farmers or fishermen directly. And also uh, consumers can say thank you or hello uh, to the farmers and the fishermen directly. So now uh, Minori-san is also uh, using our service. Ne? Thank you very much. <laughs> and now uh, like 2,200 PE farmers and fishermen are registered and the customers uh, are like 100,000 people uh, using it, which is confidential, but I just talked it. It's a kind of uh, business, yes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I think that, you know, we, again, we have so much I want to discuss and, um, and we'll be able to dive in further into each each of um, uh, each participant's uh, business further as we kind of uh, dive into these various topics. Um, but first and foremost, I thought it would be wise to to discuss a little bit about Japan's history, its its background, give a little bit of context as to um, context behind the Japanese food system. Um, and you know, I know this much about kind of an infinite amount of information. And so I'll need the support of everyone to kind of fill in the blanks. But, um, you know, J Japan, I think that everyone around the world understands it is a land um, prone to natural disasters. There have been loads of urban fires, especially in um, Edo, in Edo, Japan, in, in Tokyo, in old Tokyo. Um, there was clearly a devastating world war that ended in 1945. This was very recently, um, and so Japan's entire socio-political and and economic infrastructure has been built um, with, I think, all of this in mind. Um, Japan lost to the U.S. 
um, the biggest power being the US in World War II. And again, a lot of the, the kind of government policy ha was put in place um, due, due, due to that relationship as well. Um, and so the way that we experience food in Japan now is based on these organizations and diplomacies and that sort of thing. Um, uh, Mikio-san, I was hoping that you could help um, shed a little bit more light into kind of what kind of the lay of the land, maybe a little bit about Japan agriculture, um, how how many middlemen have been between the grower and the consumer, and how you're closing that gap. Okay, so can I can I show one paper? Yes. Here? I'm a bit afraid. I'm <laughs> I don't want to show the wrong thing, but so I, I think this paper helps. Uh -huh. And oops, sorry. So this is our goal, and uh, we I can talk a little bit history was the system. So left hand yeah. side is a current supply system. So from the farmers to the customers, we have like four or five steps, you know, like uh, like a whole wholesaler and delivery companies and the blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So uh, from the government report, uh, we could understand that uh, almost out of the final price, which like customers pay, like for example, it's a hundred yen for the like cabbage. So only 30 yen is going to the farmer. That's the average. So it means- So 30% 30 30 of the, how much consumers are paying actually goes into the pockets of the farmers. Yes, 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 correct. So uh, it depends on, of course, uh, like fruit or vegetable or what kind of fruits and the percentage is different, but uh, it's not uh, like uh, very good for, for the farmers actually. And also uh, the, our, let's say our, our uh, the, the, the problem between mm -hmm. farmers and customers, uh, uh, there is a very vis invisible wall between them. So we, we can, they cannot communicate to each other. <clears throat> and so, uh, that's why. What is uh, the invisible? Sorry, what is the invisible wall? Yeah, so normal farmers cannot talk to customers directly. Is that yeah. is that a legal thing, or is that just something that is uh, cultural? It's a more cultural and system point of view. You know, mm -hmm. like the you know, like in for example, in Fukushima, many farmers are there, and mm -hmm. uh, farmers are making fruit mm -hmm. and just uh, uh, you know. The ship out to the like you know we call it JA which is a very uh it's kind of government kind of uh big system you know like a very very let's say very very big system so mm -hmm. they just focus on making but not selling or talking to customers so uh we want to make but well, thank of course thanks to that system you know like uh, our customer consumers and customers are very happy because we could uh, saved by like uh, from the poverty on like hunger but you know like now it's uh, I don't think it's not sustainable I, I don't think it's sustainable because uh, this system is not good for the, like climate change as well and also an energy point of view so and also farmers salary or income point of view so now uh, we, we now we are thinking uh, we want to uh, get back that we want to have uh, this decentralized food system again with uh, like technology and compassion now. Yeah. Very good, very good. Um, you know, again, just to shed a little bit of light to what Mikio-san has already spoken about, Japan agriculture is an, in, it is an incredibly big, um, I would say kind of like a, political economic monster. And it was initially put in place for a good reason. After World War II, there was a lot of food distribution issues. I mean, clearly there was no 
internet and um, there it was difficult for producers to connect with consumers. Um, and that's what they that's why they were created. They're a bit of a union and now they do loans and sell pesticides and do loads of different things kind of within the agricultural business. Um, but as Mikio san says, technology has empowered us. Global communication has empowered us to be able to um, do away with many of the middlemen in between um, so that farmers can continue to produce good um, fruits and vegetables and grains and beans um, and, the, and be paid properly for it. Uh, so that's um, kind of, and I think we can go further into what this technology and compassion means a little bit later as well. Thank you. Um, and so I think that kind of goes in nicely to the second point that um, I'd love to discuss, which is shopping directly from um, farmers, taking this like large centralized system and localizing it. So everything from energy creation to education to growing and selling harvested products and um, produce and then products with longer shelf life. Um, how how we're closing that gap. Mikio Silence obviously um, uh, created a technology platform for it. Um, and I know that um, that Kyoko san is also looking to support um, brewers um, who uh, can now sell directly to consumers without, necess without necessarily having to go through an entire wholesale system. So Kyoko san, can you speak about that a little bit as well? Yes, um, actually, there are some um, several groups which are supporting the um, farmers or, you know, the producers, including the sake breweries, um, uh, it, which is called like Corona Shien. Um, it's like uh, those producers who are affected by the coronavirus so that um, their business is either uh, going uh, bad and, or, you know, there's a lot of food losses because um, uh, restaurants are not buying and stuff like that. So uh, um, it's like a subsidiary of that group. We're currently creating this support group for the sake breweries to sell for the online uh, nomikai. You know, uh, currently it's on nomi is getting a popular thingy. So that um, uh, so we're trying to create this community for the sake breweries to sell uh, sell to the consumers directly. Um, it's not like we're getting money. It's not like our platform. We're just using the social media. Um, there's a lot of community like that right now, um, um, especially in this um, difficult times. Uh, if you go on Facebook and go uh, and check it out, the Corona Xian, Corona Xian, then you will find a lot of people, more than 200,000 people uh, trying to connect directly from the farmers, or producers, uh, every, anyone. Um, however, there's a problem with the sake breweries because they do have the retailers and also uh, it's quite hard for them to like make the discount. However, uh, they can make a uh, small bottles um, set for the online nomikai, like uh, online drinking parties for this difficult times. So uh, we're trying to like clear that regulation and um, provide opportunities such as uh, like the other producers are getting through the social media. Yes, thank That's you. And you know, yeah, I'm not sure whether um, this uh, regulation is is the same, but I know that a lot of restaurants um, that were serving alcohol um, in store did not have a license to um, sell bottles directly to consumers. Um, that that requires a different alcohol license completely. Yeah, and exactly. Have, um, yeah, um, you have to apply to until like the end of June, but um, it'll be available for six months only, I guess, until this COVID-19 would be uh, over. Um, those restaurants are struggling to like even sell the uh, alcohol which they carry on the inventory. So it's more like a temporarily license that they would be getting uh, until the end of June. 
but that's only the temporary solutions that they're having. And also for the, you know, the local communities as well, um, they're trying to support e each other as much as possible. So a lot of the Shoten guys are creating this um, online, online support groups, um, trying to like uh, help with the restaurant um, delivery system. If the uh, restaurant is busy with the making bentos for takeaways, then other, uh, other empty restaurants would help with the delivery system and so so forth. So I think during this crisis, a lot of the communities are now stepping in to help support these producers or the restaurants. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it de definitely takes a village. Um, Mikasa, I know that um, with your restaurant, you look to buy directly from farmers um, and also neighborhood specialty shops as opposed to buying from large supermarkets. What are the reasons behind you, you making those choices? Mikasa. I think you're on mute. Hi. Hello. 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 Okay. Um, oh, what did you say? Um, ah, what's there's, um, I know that for your restaurant, you mm -hmm. often buy directly from farmers or you buy from local neighborhood shops. Um, mm -hmm. what, why, what are the reasons why you buy from those those shops and people as opposed to going to a large supermarket? What's, mm, mm, uh, <laughs> I know. いろいろ食材を買われると思うんですけど、それって大型のスーパーではなくて、例えば商店街のお店とか、もしくは農家さんから直接ご購入されるかと思うんですけど、その理由を、様々あるかと思うので、その理由とか教えていただければと思います。は
are really kind of blown away at how much packaging there is in Japan, um, an outrageous amount of packaging. Now, this has cultural relevance because to, to package things nicely, um, to wrap it in a linen, like a furoshiki, and, and gift it to someone, there is something incredibly valuable there. But, but through our through ease and through various other through various other reasons that kind of um, reusable and biodegradable um, fabric has now been um, ousted and now loads of um, cardboard and plastic has been has replaced it and so while um, getting things shipped and getting um, uh, produce shipped directly to our homes is um, is uh, wonderful and really cutting down the many layers of middlemen that come in between. I think we still have this issue of packaging and carbon footprint. Um, and so I'd now like to kind of speak about growing directly, um, growing directly, you know, for those people who live outside of the cities, and then also what can we do in, in urban areas as well. Um, maybe I will throw it first to um, John um, as uh, Tokyo White doing doing just that. Yeah, um, so what exactly was the question again, sorry? Um, the importance of? Oh, it's really, I mean, getting, um, buying directly from producers and farmers, I think is a really important first step, cutting out the middlemen, making sure that you have um, fresh produce at your fingertips and ensuring mm -hmm. that the people who are producing it are getting paid for what it's worth. Um, mm. But because we have such an issue globally, but particularly in Japan about packaging and carbon carbon put, footprint, mm. I think more and more we should be pivoting the conversation to grow, growing things ourselves. How much can we grow ourselves? Mm. And oh, yeah. I think it's not something yeah. that's just happening in the countryside, but certainly can happen in the city as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's sort of one of my big goals because um, I basically got into urban farming because of, of the Tohoku earthquake and I sort of realized that if a massive earthquake hit Tokyo and our supermarkets got destroyed and so on and where would food come from and I, I was specifically thinking about and food trucks coming from the countryside and bringing food to supermarkets in Tokyo. Now all of that has a carbon cost and it creates pollution so I thought right there's got to be some um, better way that we can produce food um, than shipping it in from the countryside. So I thought, right, just grow it ourselves where we live or work. So urban farming, uh, basically growing food where we live, um, it it can, um, it, it can, and um, quite definitely does produce pollution um, from trans uh, from transporting food from the countryside, and it can reduce packaging too because if we have a garden outside our house or on the rooftop. And we don't need packaging because we just have to go outside to the veranda or the rooftop and pick what we need and and walk 10 steps to the kitchen and we don't need packaging we don't need transportation so there's um i'm not um, less pollution there's no pollution uh specifically from transportation there's no packaging it's hyper fresh and if we grow from um, seeds like this it's virtually free as well so um another benefits of Urban farming. Well, um, you probably heard of the um, the, fa um, the farm to table um, the farm to table movement, which has been taking off in, in the states and in different countries around the world. That's basically aimed at de delivering food directly from the grower straight to the table where it's I'm going to be consumed. Um, there's no middlemen, which um, yeah. um, that's um, yeah that basically um, that's a really good idea too. Um, especially for taste and also um, when food gets transported tra traditionally it's pr it's often stored in warehouses and it loses the freshness but if you grow it yourself it cancels out all of that it's all fresh it's all on site and specifically for restaurants um, if um, a restaurant were growing and supermarkets were growing food on their rooftop all they would need to do is have staff go to the rooftop and pick the food that they want and take it downstairs to the restaurant or the supermarket. So, and the benefits of growing your own, it's, it's all good. It's absolutely incredible. And yeah, twice no, wise too. no, absolutely. And this is such a hot um, 
poignant topic for me personally right now. And so um, uh, please make a note that I will be calling you um, later this week for more information um, because I'd love to talk more about like heirloom, because my theory is that actually heirloom varietals work best in the city um, and for a number of reasons. And, um, because uh, many people who are who are doing um, bit on the side by what we say bit on the side by, but like, you know, on the, on our small balconies, or if you're lucky enough to have a roof balcony, a lot of people do like some mint or like rosemary or shisel if they're lucky, um, but not like vegetables that you can really sink your teeth in. Yes, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. That's a really, really good point because and when I walk around the town that I live in, um, in North Tokyo, um, lots of people are growing things are either trees or shrubs or flowers. But the point is that um, wherever there's a different kind of plant growing, and um, people could grow food, and um, they could be growing herbs, and they could be growing vegetables. All they need to do is, is basically wait until their flower, their shrub, their tree, whatever died, take it out, change the soil to, um, to basically multi-purpose um, soil that's used to grow vegetables, and grow fruit instead. Mm-hmm. It's really easy. So Absolutely. the way that I see it, um, more like people could for, grow food. Yeah, yes. and for those of us, I think who 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 live alone or small families, it's a little bit of a daunting idea to mm-hmm. think like we're going to get like large white daikon radishes all across our you know small balconies in our city apartments. Um, but there are loads of heirloom varietals that are like small little black daikon radishes, or like do you know what I mean? Um, little colorful carrots, and I think that for the younger audience and also for those who are looking for more petite and colorful um, vegetables, these heirloom seeds are actually spot on. Um, and so again, a conversation that I'd love to kind of um, have, have, have with you um, at a later time as well. But it, do you have any thoughts around heirloom varietals in Japan versus not? Oh, um, um, I see, on um, the, um, the, um, the main, um, issue that I see about I'm using heirloom seeds is uh, and basically how long they can last because mm-hmm. like many farmers know um, um, hybrid seeds um, they basically have a use by date um, and and they basically um, they lose their fertility past that particular date um, heirloom seeds um, by contrast can be stored and some people freeze them so that they can be used again and again and again um, unlike farmers um, used to do right through um, right through history. Um, yeah, so I'm um, using heirloom seeds. You can basically store, and you can yeah, you can basically uh, um, keep the genes going. Um, oh. And to, yeah, so yeah. Um, but when it comes to actually and um, practically growing food using heirloom seeds or hybrid seeds, I think personally, um, I'm sure there's certain um, health issues uh, with the GMO seeds, and they have been known to cause um, uh, big problems when it comes to rats. At, and so on. Um, but I think the more important thing is the soil that the seeds are growing in. And the simple fact, um, do you um, use chemicals or not? And I personally think that, and that the way that the seeds are growing is more important than what kind of seeds they are. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, okay, because the thing is, I want to, yeah. Yeah, no, that's um, very useful information. Um, when it comes to growing fruit, Um, William, I see your note about expiration date um, of food. I think we can talk about that a little bit later, but you, we also got a little bit of insight into expiration dates when it comes to seeds. So that was very um, helpful, John, thank you. Um, you know, for, for those who us, of us who choose to live in the city, I mean, I romanticize all the time about living in the countryside. Um, but then when I go to the countryside, I also see the, 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 the great benefits of living in the city, like um, culture, the arts, um, kind of where great, great minds come together and build new ideas. And, um, and I think that not everyone can move to the city. Uh, there's there's um, economic terms in, in Japanese called like U-turn or I-turn. Um, U-turn is for those people who used to live in the countryside or their hometowns are in the countryside and they moved to the city, but now they're moving back into the countryside. And then there's this concept of I-turn, which is um, those people who were born and bred in the cities, but 
like kind of like me had this kind of idealized vision of living in the countryside and working with the earth and living more of like a quote unquote human life and um and so they moved to the countryside for the very first time and um and I think that now actually there's a new movement that I personally am coining O-turn, which means going back and forth, back and forth. And I think techno technology in its greatest form has really enabled us to be able to, to live that dream out, is to kind of live a dual life going back and forth between the city and the, and, the, and the countryside. But clearly, you know, when we talk about the earth, the sun, being able to sun dry things without the crows getting them, um, all of that, it, it's this country life that we all dream of. Um, and so I'd really um, like to kind of now pass the baton to Minori-san about what it's like to live in the countryside and of the Japanese countryside. I think that for many people who are living outside of Japan, if we say Japanese countryside, they think of like Totoro and the Ghibli movies. Um, and what your thoughts, what Minori San, your thoughts are on this kind of dual life between the city and the countryside? Uh, yeah, so living in a country, it's a, for me, it's, it's like I feel it's a real life is because you're super connected to nature and um, yeah, it's like, I, I totally agree with what John Sun said to uh, turn consumer to producer, even who uh, live in a city. Um, but <laughs> of course there's a limitation and like living in countryside, like you just right. receive like yeah. thousands of gifts from, from the nature of course, but also from people um, like, now I'm living in a town which is called Nishiaizu, which is border oh, of Fukushima and Niigata Prefecture. And the population is oh, yeah, about 6,400, something like that. Yeah. And um, the village, which is belong to the uh, Nishiaizu, uh, which is called Aza, is where Dana village is and where I live. Mm -hmm. And we have only 100 population in a huge area. And like now it's a springtime, so we eat uh, the lunch for today was a uh, yomogi genovese, like a <gasps> yomogi Japanese Lucky. mogi. <laughs> it's like, uh, of course, in a city, yomogi goes everywhere, but um, you always uh, wor should worry about the pollution and stuff. But here it's like, um, no, not polluted and super healthy. And so, um, First of all, like for me, that's, there's no reason to live in a city. <laughs> and um, once I go to the city, uh, first thing I notice is the air is totally different. I can't like breathe like deeply, like it doesn't make me feel too pleased. <laughs> Sorry to the many of you who live in uh, Tokyo, but um, yeah. And to be a farmer, uh, my intention is not produce um, vegetables to sell, but mostly to sustain our style. And I really want to be a uh, like model um, to, the, to the many people who live in the uh, monetized and urban system to shift to more grounding and more connect to the nature. Not, it's not only for the environment, but all, also for the human health as well. Um, we also have a guest house. We open the space for the guests who wants to stay with us. And um, I just heard from lots of people that just staying with us for a few days makes them um, balance their uh, uh, blood pressure, for example. I met the same person after one year, but she still maintained her blood pressures in very good conditions. And like someone who stayed with us a few days, she stopped taking sleeping tablet, which she has been taking for more than years, but she could sleep very well. Mm -hmm. And like a lot of allergy symptoms, constipation, like all those um, that physical condition from my perspective, it comes from um, not balancing lifestyle. So not balancing doesn't mean only because you live in Tokyo or big city, 
but I think um, I often talk about nature deficit disorder, which is just um, really this from, it comes from this connection of the nature, that which means environmental nature, as well as the nature which comes from uh, yourself. So for me, many people who um, uh, just to seek the like money um, and like to need to grab everything, they often have a fearness or like um, balance of themselves. So, but for me, like living in a country with what you really want to do is just just a life, <laughs> life without um, any fear. And like, for example, now it's a really uh, symbolistic time with COVID-19 for us, which that almost didn't change anything for us. So we just go to the farm, we can do enjoy and just in front of us, there's beautiful, space and everything so and food of course and water you can just take from everywhere and the toilet paper you can maybe leave uh, use a leaf from outside so we, i never worry about it so yeah like all those stuff maybe sounds a bit too much for some of you but for me it's just really natural and feels super good <laughs> so mm -hmm. i want to really encourage people to uh, take this um, crisis as a chance to think about the life, what they really want to do. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. And I think that, you know, for those who of us who live in the city, there's a stark difference between um, the, the scenes that you see at large um, supermarkets where people are really kind of like out for themselves and making sure that they have, they've taken all of the toilet paper and they've bought all of the, um, you know, um, dried pasta and all of that. Um, and when you go to kind of the smaller um, shops, whether it's like the tofu specialty shop or the green grocer, people are there really to just buy what they need for themselves for that day. And whether you're living in the countryside or in the city, you see quite a difference in these two over, yeah. these two general populations um, and the, the latter that choose to buy directly from producers or green grocers I think also have a tendency to um, to have strong relationships with the people in the countryside as well visiting often um, buying uh, veggie boxes from them um, going to help for rice planting season and harvesting season um, and those relationships I think are not just for our health and for for the for the kind of wealth of our ecosystem but also um to nurture the heart like you say i think there's something very telling about um eating eating things with a lot of um life force and energy and um also speaking and speaking with people and um and uh meeting with people who kind of live and breathe the earth um, we have like very little time left and there's a lot more I want to discuss. Um, the, the next topic I kind of want to talk about, um, the traditional Japanese micro seasonal calendar and um, uniquely Japanese ways to incorporate um, uh, the, the uniquely Japanese way that ways that we prevent or reduce food loss and food waste. Um, and kind of high on that list is food preservation. So fermentation, sun drying, pickling food. Um, and when I say the traditional Japanese micro seasonal calendar, I'm talking about koyomi, living with koyomi, the, the, the changing of the seasons. Um, for those of, for those of you who are kind of, um, learning about the traditional Japanese micro seasonal calendar for the first time. It's um, very, very simply said, there's kind of more complex than this, but very, very simply said, it is the four seasons that break down mm -hmm. into 24 sub seasons that then mm -hmm. break down into 72 micro seasons. So when you break all of that down into 72 micro seasons, basically every five days, the season changes. And it's like, it's like poetry, it's, it's talking about 
being able to see rainbows for the first time, hearing this bird, uh, seeing this type of um, foliage on the ground. Um, and it's just a reminder that nature is very ephemeral and ever changing and it's kind of this circle of life and fermentation and sun drying and food preservation, it, it all falls under different, different um, parts of the year. Um, so maybe Kyoko-san, oh, kawaii. Kyoko-san, maybe you can talk a little bit about, about kind of food preservation and how sake and other things kind of fall into that category. Right. So I don't know if everybody knows about koji. Of course, um, a lot of people in Japan lived with it. Um, we have a special mold bacteria called koji, which is the Japanese national mold. And we use a lot to uh, preserve food. For instance, uh, miso is made from rice koji and soybean. And um, you can also make uh, miso from other stuff like pumpkin or whatever. We kind of um, experiment in making a new type of a miso right now, like using the <laughs> acorn, for instance, <laughs> and um, experimenting miso making right now for the hako farm. And also um, soy sauce, it's also made from the koji. And also sake is obviously made from koji. So we use a lot of rice, uh, rice koji, uh, which is quite unique to our culture. And also it's very much uh, useful when preserving food and also fermenting food. So um, in every seasons, we have a very um, different, different kind of seasonal um, food or seasonal uh, fish. Um, you can also marinate it with the sake kasu sometimes, you know. Uh, in, when making the sake, you have a byproduct of sake, which is called sake kasu. And um, you can marinate uh, the, well with the sake kasu as well. So there's so many ways that we Japanese nationals learn from the old days how to preserve food with the koji mold and also with the sake kasu or whatever the products we have. Um, it's quite unique to our culture and it's very essential uh, to our food um, eating culture. Um, I would um, like to- Just, uh, Sorry, I didn't want to, I didn't want, I want to um, stop you because I think that we can dive so much into just koji even. <laughs> yes, um, I, I did yeah. want to, I wanted to throw it out there that there is such a deep um, fermenting culture in Japan and every nook and cranny of the Japanese countryside has their unique way yeah, yeah, of exactly. fermenting. Yeah, mm -hmm. and like you said at the you said at the very top, there's um, what did you say, four hundred and fifty different types. Um, yeah, um, four hundred different kinds. Oh, well, I mean, I think it's amazing. Like in Kumamoto, you have like a very unique. Um, soy sauce like it's just like no color or sometimes you have this very unique um uh fermented um puff, puffer fish you know puffer fish has a lot of poison in it but it, it preserves organs with it so it'll be non-toxic so there's a lot of ways to eat as much as possible for using the power of the fermentation in uh, every region they have such kind of a unique new unique um food in each yes. region I think so too. So really to close this out, I wanna make sure that we kind of talk just a bit about education and educating our children um, and educating the masses that may have, you know, learned that going to the supermarket is the only place that you can buy food. Um, mm -hmm. Mikio-san, can you speak a little bit about kind of, you know, how your work relates to um, education and um, how we might be able to, you know, use use products like yours to to help our children think beyond the box. Uh, yeah, by the way, we only have one minute left. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, now uh, we try to connect. You know, like farmers and fishermen and consumers. So education is going on between them. So we don't make. Uh, so you know, like uh, like this weekend, fishermen is having a Zoom meetings and uh, how to cut the fish and how to utilize the head part and bone part like that. So we try to uh, reduce the food waste both sides, like uh, producer side and consumer side. And also uh, techniques as well, you know, like as koji and like uh, pickles and as well. So we, uh, we are now, uh, uh, we have a big collaboration with many companies or like you guys. 
and yeah. we want to educate having a like educational session as well yeah that's Thank true you. it's really not just about connecting growers with consumers but also how to use the the the, the produce that comes into our hands we might be used to seeing um you know bamboo shoots that not in this big form but cut up and you know packaged in the supermarkets and so being able to see the real thing and then trying to figure out then how to use it i think are kind of two different things thank you so much again i'm so sorry that there's such a limited time and that <clears throat> there's really so much more i want to discuss so i will likely be contacting each of you separately but um and i so appreciate all of the questions that have come in i see each and every one of them and i want to make sure that um they get addressed properly so if there's a way that i can contact Contact you directly, um, I would absolutely do so. So, um, thank you to all of the present um, the speakers today. Um, it's so lovely to be able to um, gather all of these entrepreneurs in one space and and actually speak in English so that there's the entire world can see the brilliant things that you're doing on a day to day basis. Sorry, Chris, for being so slow. I will pass the baton back to you. No, please, please don't apologize at all. That that was great. Uh, I this is just serves as the perfect excuse to have round two uh, and three and four with with probably the same group because there's so much to talk about. Thank you guys so much for your time, the amazing questions, um, and sorry again that we didn't get to everyone. But we're going to uh, now kick it back over to China with the hosts Kerong Wang and Dong Dong Jing Feng. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, so this will be part four of the of the marathon uh, between Future Food and FAO Food for Earth Day. So thank you very much uh, for tuning in, and and you guys can can take it from here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.